This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. I think we all know, and I won't spend a lot of time talking about it except as a way of setting up what this discussion is, that autism is a heterogeneous disorder. There are a number of different things that we see that suggest there's different subtypes, there's different ways of understanding it. 20 to 50 percent of kids uh, with autism have regressive autism. And good studies at the Mind Institute have indicated that, that that's around 30 percent. Others have looked in that same area, uh, about that same number. There are GI abnormalities in 30 to 70 percent. You'd say, well, that's a broad range. Well, the 70% is at GI clinics, not surprisingly, and the 30% is in family practice clinics where people are asked to remember retrospectively. But clearly, these are different kinds of kids. Some have no GI abnormalities at all. Some have really very troublesome GI abnormalities that cause them difficulties for many years. 30% develop seizures, not as infants, as infantile seizures, but in adolescence or in early adulthood. 70% according to the DSM-4 are mentally retarded, although that'll probably become less. Now with better treatments uh, and better early interventions, the number will likely be less. People report high levels of serotonin. Others report low levels of serotonin. So we see a wide disparity even in the most common neurotransmitter found to be abnormal in autism. Mitochondrial disorders were something that we thought of for many years as being very rare. And the one autism vaccine case that has been won was won by Jonathan Polin on behalf of his little daughter, Hannah, who was found uh, after she received nine vaccinations at one time to have uh, a mitochondrial disorder. And the vaccine court said on the basis of that, they felt perhaps there was an association, and they awarded John, who's a neurologist and a, a articulate, nice man, awarded him and his family on behalf of Hannah a million and a half dollars. I think when we all first heard that, we we thought, well, mitochondrial disorders are very rare. This isn't really much of an issue for autism in real life. And yet there have been now a number of good studies, including one from the Mind Institute, indicating that as many as 30 percent, and perhaps even more, have some evidence of mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondria are those little energy bunnies that drive your cell, that move your body forward. They're the energy source in your body. And increasingly, we're finding that genetic disorders, complex and simple genetic disorders, are associated with autism. And when we first started thinking about that, the incidence was maybe 1 to 5 percent. Rondi Hagram would, ar would argue it's as high as 20 or 25 percent. But most people say now we're maybe up to 15 percent where we can find a known genetic cause of people who have autism. But there are different genetic etiologies. We know that there's big changes in the prevalence of autism, th that um, over the years we've moved from 1 in 10,000 to where we're now at 1 in 88, or uh, uh, we've seen a 600 percent increase in the past two, two decades. Now, as Dr. Abaduda alluded to this morning, and as others have as well, there's some argument about is that a real change or is that a, um, uh, just a, a, a change in our recognition? Good studies, again, from the Mind Institute, from Irva hertz Pachoto and the group that she's with would suggest maybe that we can account for half of that by changing diagnostic practices and people recognizing it more. But we're seeing an increase, and so as we look at that, we're beginning to say, well, then what could account for that? What could account for that increase if it's not just a genetic disorder, but it's something more and involves a gene environment interaction? 
So there's the things like diagnostic expansion, better reporting, increasing recognition, increased accept acceptability, but we say, well, that doesn't do more than 50%. What about things like environmental toxins, infections, uh, immune vulnerability, and things like epigenetics? And increasingly, I think, people are beginning to think that's a very real part of autism, but it also leads to say, well, then if we believe that, then what kinds of things can we do to affect that epigenetic process? And that's where we're gonna go in the majority of the talk today. Clearly, autism is a genetic disorder, but we know that multiple genes are involved, and there are few of the genes that have been found that account for more than a few percentage points, except maybe for fragile X, of the people who actually have autism. So it's not one gene. It seems to be an interaction between genes. And as um, our previous speaker outlined in looking at environmental risks that were involved. There are some that are documented, like prenatal and early postnatal exposure to viral infections, uh, Depico, valproic acid, and thalidomide. Proposed, though, kinds of things that are involved are as many as there are people in this room that would range from mercury, lead, environmental toxins, but low levels of vitamin D. Um, none of those have been proven other than in a kind of an associational kind of way to be associated with the incidence of autism. Parental age, number of explanations saying why it is that we seem to find fairly regularly that older male, older father age, paternal age, seems to be associated, and variably older maternal age also seems to be. Is it that older people have accumulated more toxins in their environment? that those toxins affect germ cells that get passed on? Are there other factors that come with aging that might play a role? Maternal metabolic conditions have been shown in a number of good studies from the Mind Institute that Dr. Hansen was part of publishing. Influenza or fever during pregnancy, uh, another from the mind, and genetic susceptibility. So if we boil that down to a kind of simple formula, and someone says, what causes autism? Well, in truth, we don't fully know. But if we say, what is the evidence pointing to? We could say there are kind of three main factors. Clearly, there's a genetic neurodevelopmental vulnerability. As we saw in the previous slide and in some of the previous talks today, one can see that there's a autism is a strongly genetic disorder. But it's not fully a genetic disorder. There's that first vulnerability that then a second hit comes along, an environmental stress, stressor that leads to an interaction between those two. Something from the environment interacts with that vulnerability to create the beginnings of autism. But the third hit comes along when we say autism is a hopeless disorder and there's nothing we can do to treat it. We found that by early identification, good early targeted treatments, we can make a real difference in how people do and, and how they can even come off the spectrum and show great progress, sometimes with nutritional interventions, sometimes with, with uh, behavioral interventions, but a, a variety of ways that we seem to be able to re-sculpt or change the way the brain is growing so that we see great improvements, whereas when we said it was a hopeless condition, sure enough it was because people didn't get those kinds of early interventions that at least for many can make a big difference. That kind of thinking, though, that gene-environment interaction is, in a sense, changing the way we're beginning to think about how can we make a full, integrated kind of intervention for autism. And the slide says, I'm afraid you've had a paradigm shift. And I think our field is having a beginning of a paradigm shift as we're saying, we're not going to treat that j this just with a behavioral intervention. We're not going to say it's a hopeless disorder. But how can we think of all the things that surround someone to in many ways try and think of how can we improve their resilience? How can we improve their ability to get on and to interact with others and to become healthier and healthier in the way that they're interacting rather than using a model that would say, if we could just find the antibiotic for autism, we could give that we could stomp out that autism caucus or whatever it is that's causing this disorder, how could we help the body's resilience push back and help them grow in healthy kinds of ways? 
So a model that I first introduced when I was still at the Mind Institute and I've worked on some since then was this that was saying if we were to think about the brain or the body of someone with autism as a slice through the earth and say that that expression of their autism when we see it on the outside looks like the, the surface of the earth and, and those are the symptoms, and we could say the DNA is the core of the earth. For many years, we looked at autism only as the surface. We said it was those symptoms, and the DSM encourages us to do that. It says those are statistically reliable symptom clusters that allow us to make a diagnosis based on symptoms. We said, no, that didn't work, so maybe we'll find the gene that causes autism, and then we've said, no, it's not as simple as any one gene. And as our last speaker said, it's really the way the genes are expressing themselves. What's happening in a sense in the center of the earth, in the gene expression, and the way the cells are forming, and the way that the brain is beginning to form. And we could say then, is there something we could do that intervenes here that changes that process? Well, when I first showed this slide at one of our Friday conferences at the Mind Institute, I said in a way that I meant to be nice, but maybe didn't sound nice, to Sally Rogers, who does a wonderful job in making early interventions and making a difference. I said, Sally, you know, you're working up here on the symptoms. You're doing behavioral treatments with these kids. We've got to figure out how to work down here. And Sally said in a way that she can say, no, you're wrong, Bob. And she said that what I'm doing, if I get these kids early enough, is that I'm able to re-sculpt their neurons. I'm able to change the way their brain is growing. And Sally was right. There is a way that those good, early targeted treatments can make a difference in this kind of place. And that's what I tried to show with the arrows and with the endophenotypes. As some of you know, my wife is French, and our youngest daughter has been living in France and going to school, and she has a French boyfriend kind of worries me a little bit that she might marry this French guy and then I'd really have to work on my French for our grandchildren uh, so that I could have some way of communicating, but he's from Alsace. And summer before last, or a year ago, we went to visit his family in Alsace, and when we were visiting them, they said, let's go to some wineries. So we went to some Alsatian wineries, and the people there were talking about the terroir, the, you know, the, what it is that makes their Alsatian wine so good. They said, you know, it's not just the amount of clay or the volcanic, the amount of volcanic soil or the, the other, the sand and things like that that go into making the terroir that makes our grapes great. And it's not just the amount of sunlight or the amount of rain that we get. It's also the people who till the soil, those folks that are there and put themselves into the soil and the way that all this is growing, that makes the terroir and that's what makes Alsatian wines so good. Well, I think the same is true for how we think about children growing their brains and how we could think about intervening with autism. We can make interventions at all of these places to make a good sepage, that we can improve the terroir, to improve the way the grape is growing. And as we think about making interventions, we might make some at these different levels. And I'll tell you more about how I might think of that or how I think when I'm trying to make an intervention, how many levels can I make an intervention? How many different ways can I try and pull together to make a difference in how this child's brain is growing? So we could start off by saying, is there some way that we could make assessments that would help us think about how to target treatments to particular areas? Well, we can make assessments, obviously, for level one by symptoms. We can make assessments for level, for the, the most basic level, or level four we can on the symptoms. For level one, we can with genetic testing. But in this level two and three, what kind of additional tests can we make? You may go see your doctor with your child with autism and say, what kind of blood tests are you going to do to help with this? And for the most part, we have no consensus about what that might be. We struggle with that. So last winter, we had a conference that some people from the mine came to, but also people from all over the country that were thinking in this biomedical way about what kind of level two and three assessments could we make that would help us 
know what process is going on that we could begin to target. And we're moving ahead at a multi-site trial to try to look at different kinds of laboratory tests that would help us begin to better identify and then target treatments. So there's some standard labs that everybody would think of doing. There are some that are a little less standard that you'll see as it goes on through this list. None of them are ones that I'm suggesting should be done on a routine basis for everybody, but that's what we would be doing in the kind of multi-site assessment to get a large enough number of patients that could help us look at a number of factors that are involved. We'd do a CGH array and an FMR1 DNA testing, but looking at things that would be a measure of oxidative stress or mitochondrial dysfunction that could help us say, are those things that are things that we can see that are abnormal now that could become a target for our interventions, inflammatory processes that might be playing a role, or even looking at things that would involve GI function. We might also include, and we are in this particular collaborative study, looking at hormones or allergy testing, toxins, and if people are actually collecting CSF, doing a spinal tap, looking for other factors like BDNF and folate, that for, many, for some subpopulation might be playing a role that could be better treatment targets for us. There are other kinds of things that the group of us agreed would be more research kinds of assessments that we would do based on different sites that are actually using some of these different testings that could be helpful to us. We think that the Mind Institute will be one part of that, but there are several other centers that have an interest in that. And many of these tests have been done already by Dr. Hansen and others and many of the tests that, studies that have been done here so far. But the part that would be different would be to say, does this lead us into any kind of a treatment or a treatment target that we could use? Because a part of this would be looking at the treatments that these people receive at the different sites and matching those to be able to say, could we better determine who's going to benefit? So then if we think about level-based interventions, again, at level four would be those behavioral interventions, level one gene modification, as we heard in the last talk. But what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about is these level two and three kinds of interventions that we might think of targeting processes that are happening there. So level two, psycho psychotropic medications, and this is my quick condensation of a talk on psychopharmacology that should take several hours, but we could say that distractible inattention improves with stimulants. Not all inattention, distractible inattention, and we see that with people who have ADHD. Maybe 20% of people with autism also may be ones that would benefit from stimulant medication. They can have bad side effects, they can come unglued, one needs to be careful. But we'll talk in a minute about RUP studies that have indicated that stimulants can benefit those kids with distractible inattention who also have autism. Impulsivity and anxiety can improve with SSRIs. We wondered at first whether that was improvement that we were seeing in OCD type features, but we'll talk in a minute about studies that suggest maybe not. Affective instability improves with mood stabilizers, and we'll talk more about each of these areas. Cognitive disorganization improving with atypical neuroleptics, and hyperarousal with alpha adrenergic agonists like clonidine and guanfacin. So if we take each of these and look at those as targets, we could start by looking at medications for ADHD and autism. Response weights are generally lower than if there's just ADHD, and there seems to be greater risk for side effects, as I alluded to. But while we used to say we shouldn't use stimulant medications for kids with autism, and many times parents come in saying, oh yeah, somebody tried a stimulant with my child and he came unglued and was psychotic, I don't ever want to try that again. There are ways that for at least some kids, slow, careful upward titration can lead to improvements in distractible inattention. And the RUP, which is a research unit for pediatric pharmacology, did double-blind placebo-controlled trials with 72 youth using methylphenidate, Ritalin, which suggested improvement in some, but with lower rates of improvement and more adverse events than in children with ADHD, but 
with those children with ASD, with autism spectrum disorder, there was improvement in those ADHD symptoms. There has been one recent study that looking at atomoxetine, uh, Stratera, suggesting with a large study of 97 patients that in children 6 to 17, they showed improvement in ADHD symptoms in a randomized control trial that showed moderate improvement and adverse events that were similar to those with ADHD alone, but not, uh, not quite as much improvement. But it seemed to be well tolerated. In my practice, I generally start with stimulant medication. If I have a bad reaction, but feel that there was a partial response, I would be more inclined to move to something like Stratera, which works more on the noradrenergic or the norepinephrine system, whereas stimulants work more on dopamine. This is usually a large section of my talk, but in terms of what has come from recent studies in the past two years, this has been it, the RUP study and the atomoxetine study. And if you want to talk more about stimulants and ADHD-like symptoms in folks with autism spectrum disorder, I'd be happy to do that to, with you in the uh, last part of our time together. So for impulsivity, we do find kids with autism often have lots of trouble with impulsivity. And you can try more behavioral interventions, like prolonging thinking before action, using educational and behavioral focuses, things like the social skills group at the Mind Institute and at other places, practicing delay and response inhibition and reflection. Using CBT type approaches, there are a number of places now that are starting to do CBT in children with autism spectrum disorders and finding some benefit, some worry that CBT may lead obsessive people to be more obsessive. But for people that are good at modifying CBT to work well, they're finding some benefits. There's also a way of thinking of strengthening the cultural container that surrounds this child. So if you go to a setting where the child is likely to get overstimulated and be impulsive, perhaps there are ways that you can think of either giving them some time away from that setting, finding other kinds of things, and techniques, and ways that you can use. And I think the social skills groups at the mines are often places trying to help parents learn how to use that cultural container to help the child not be so impulsive. But there are pharmacologic interventions as well. Stimulants can be modestly helpful. SSRIs can in some cases. And mood stabilizers, which we'll talk more about in a few minutes, can maybe be helpful as well. But we used to think SSRIs were good for treating the OCD type symptoms with autism. There was a good double-blind placebo-controlled trial done through this RUP network that looked at 149 children aged 5 to 17 with autism, used not a high dose, but what should have been an adequate dose, and found no significant difference between the active and the placebo group. It surprised even those people that were part of that study. They felt that SSRIs would make a difference. That's why they were choosing to study it for autism. And they were surprised to find that using citalopram, Celexa, that they didn't find any real difference. There was a 34.2% placebo response rate that is a high placebo response rate. So if you're going to go show separation from placebo and active, you have to get a, pretty, a very, very good response rate to show that separation. So the placebo response may have been part of the explanation. It may be, too, that citalopram is not, your fa it's not my favorite SSRI. Maybe that wasn't working as well as others might have been. And yet there was a good review from seven randomized control trials with 271 subjects saying that there was evidence of no real benefit in children and maybe limited benefit of SSRIs. People, though, more recently have been saying, maybe we picked the wrong target, OCD. Maybe we should have been looking at anxiety. And there are quite a few studies now in process looking at SSRIs treating anxiety in children with autism and looking at those for maybe things that look like OCD, but the target that might be more effective would be looking at, at anxiety. 
that anxious hyperarousal, a kid that just easily gets stimulated, that seems to jump easily, that, that it looks almost like they have post-traumatic stress disorder in the way that they get upset, can benefit at times from stress management, stress reduction, stress anticipation, but there are pharmacologic interventions that can be helpful as well the SSRIs, as I'd mentioned, but then the alpha adrenergic blockers like clonidine and guanfacin. We've started thinking of those more lately as we're thinking about long-acting forms that have come out in the last couple years. The long-acting clonidine is Intinev, and there are several investigator-initiated trials going on right now looking at Intinev and treating some of the um, anxious symptoms or inattentive symptoms in children with autism. The long-acting form of clonidine is CAPFE, and uh, I don't know of any studies going on with autism at this point, but those then can be given once a day, generally, and last for about 12 hours, and can have a good side effect profile with a modest response in anxiety and with toning down that anxious hyperarousal. Affective instability, these kids that tend to have meltdowns and just come unglued. We can try to do things to help by rehearsal and those other things that we talked about in groups to strengthen that cognitive path from the perception of emotion to action. What are you going to do when you get in this situation? How could you practice not becoming unglued? How could we use a distraction to help in those ways? I remember one boy that I was seeing in one of our studies, but was also seen for therapy, who came used to have these terrible meltdowns. And he figured what he could do with some help from his mom to help him with that was to get a lucky rabbit's foot. And every time he started to feel like he was going to have a meltdown, he'd pull out his lucky rabbit's foot. And so he came in to see me one day, and he told me about this, how well it was working, because it had him think about something else when he was getting ready to melt down. And I said, gee, that's great. Can you show me your lucky rabbit's foot? And he reached into his front pockets to get his lucky rabbit's foot, and it wasn't there. And then he reached in his back pockets, and it wasn't there. And then he reached in his pants, and he couldn't find it there. And he ran out of my office screaming for his mother to get him his lucky rabbit's foot because it was falling apart. And his mother knew how bad that was, and she didn't have the lucky rabbit's foot. And he couldn't seem to think about anything else. And soon he was laying on the floor, rolling around, screaming, having a meltdown. And one of the psychologists that was part of our study team came up and said something to him in his ear that I think had to do with his Game Boy and got him thinking about something else and he stopped. He stopped that meltdown and you may find that with certain kids that if you can find a way to distract them, to get them to think about something else, that that distraction can get them out of a meltdown. But if you do things that stay there with them, maybe trying to control that, that they will more and more stay in that meltdown and stay falling apart. The boy did stop his meltdown, but my secretary quit after that. I said, I've had enough of this at home. I'd rather not have any more of it here. Um, one might also think about atypical neuroleptics, think about using mood stabilizers. And as we know, for atypical neuroleptics, both risperidone and aripiprazole have been approved for the treatment of irritability in autism. Those are the only two agents, only two medications that we'll talk about today that have FDA approval for treatment of any aspect of autism. There are others that are going to the FDA right now and we'll tell you briefly about what some of those are as we go on through the rest of the talk. Mood stabilizers can also be thought about because they seem to inhibit GABA, that kind of dampening neuron, or glutamate they inhibit, which is a kind of an excitatory neurotransmitter, and those mood stabilizers can help with that affective instability. Cognitive disorganization, where these kids just get unglued or don't think well or can seem almost psychotic because their executive function isn't working well and those primitive thoughts, those uncontrolled thoughts are coming through from a deeper part of the limbic part of the brain. One can think about social skills, behavioral interventions, CBT, but one also thinks about pharmacologic interventions like risperidone and aripiprazole. 
Often, though, we find many of these agents have a lot of side effects that are troubling to us, and I think we try and stay away from them, and it would be awfully nice to have other kinds of treatments that we could use that didn't cause children to put on way too much weight or to develop movement disorders or to have other kinds of side effects. And sometimes we go through trying those, and they seem to work well, although the side effects then say, well, we can't keep on with this, or we find they work well and then they don't. There are some new agents that are out that haven't been tried with autism in any kind of published studies, but a centipede is one new one that you need to take sublingually. Seems to have no weight gain associated with it. I've tried it with a number of kids on the spectrum now, and a number have done quite well. I've had one kid that almost seemed to have a kind of awakening for about three months where the parents said he hasn't done this well for 15 years. He was a boy who was 16 who was just very, very inhibited, very uh, had meltdowns, didn't do well, put on a lot of weight on risperidone and aripiprazole, but on acenapine he just was more alert, was engaged, seemed to be doing well, and then after three months it went away. And we tried different doses, none of those seemed to make any difference. We went back to other meds, none made a difference. But it's made me think some about a centipede, and I have a number of patients, some who put on huge amounts of weight, that are doing okay, um, and their weight is actually going down. Laricidone, Latuda, is another new antipsychotic medication that doesn't seem to have weight gain associated with it. I've tried one patient at this point, and he didn't do very well. But the pharmaceutical companies are beginning to think about trying that now with at least bipolar and, and uh, schizophrenia. We're doing some PK studies for them now in a way to try and consider whether that might be a medication that we can use in, uh, in other disorders without that large amount of weight gain, but it has the movement disorder side effects. But I think people are beginning to think harder and harder about how to find new medications, put them in the pipeline, and use them for disorders in childhood that aren't quite as troubling. And then for affective instability, one can again think of treating that cognitive path from perception to emotion to action and then use things like CBT and dialectic behavioral therapy and then pharmacologic treatments. So in, as kind of my last slide in pharmacologic agents, before I go into thinking more about biomedical treatments or kind of unusual medical treatments, we can think about other medications that might be considered, and I know this is way too fast to go through all these treatments unless it's something that you're somewhat familiar with, but my goal was to at least give you a quick review of what's new and what's old that's still being used in new ways, and then to go on to thinking more about biomedical treatments. Propranolol is a beta blocker. Historically, we used to think, well, that's a good medication to be used for people that have an or more of an organic brain syndrome and they're aggressive. It was kind of a treatment that we kept back for that. But the group out of the University of Missouri is finding that it seems to be making a big difference in other aspects of autism, and they have several trials now looking at propranolol and treating autism, seeing how it helps with anxiety, with aggression, with other kinds of behaviors. And I think it's led some of us to consider using Propranolol a little more frequently than we did before with some benefits. Amantadine is something that has had a few trials that suggest a modest effect. It's not one that I use much of. Decycloserine, again working on a different kind of neurotransmitter system that showed a modest effect but not a strong effect. Cholinesterase inhibitors, again, small benefits. Some of those, those last two studies were done by Michael Chez, who's here in town in Sacramento. Nicotinic agonists have been used with, with modest benefit. But one that we'll talk more in a few minutes that has suggested some benefit in autism has been memetine, Nemenda, which is a medication that's a NMDA receptor agonist that works on the glutamate receptors to block them, that excitatory neurotransmitter, and it's used to treat Alzheimer's. But there were three different studies, one from Michael Chez, one from two other groups, 
um, suggesting that it made a benefit. And there's now a double-blind placebo-controlled multi-site trial looking at Namenda that we'll talk a little bit more about as we get more further into the talk. Naltrexone used to say try 25, 50 milligrams of naltrexone, seems to be an opioid blocker, helps with some kids with autism and a lot of aggression. I have to say for the most part I didn't find that that was of great benefit, maybe in a few cases, but not in a large number. But then people talked about low dose naltrexone, two and a half to five milligrams that might even be put into a cream by a compounding pharmacy and then put on the child uh, so that it stays there at that level, at that low dose level. Some people have found that that seems to affect immune function and might have some benefits for kids with autism and for their aggression. There are no good published studies of that, or there are people that publish, but not double-blind placebo-controlled trials, anecdotes that suggest some benefit. But it's one of those things that I pull out when I get to the very end of saying what might be helpful. And I have found some kids in an open-label way whose parents and I think they make a modest benefit from putting this cream with the naltrexone on it. The other one that's been interesting to me has been Boosperone. Boosbar is an anti-anxiety agent. It's very mild, and some people think it's a good agent to use when you want to use a placebo, because it's so mild that it doesn't really do very much. But some people would say it helps with anxiety and helps these kids. I've had some parents come in and tell me, I think Boosbar helped my kid. I said, I don't think so. They said, well, I'd like to give it a try. I said, OK, let's do. And it seems in some kids to make enough difference that there are now three trials listed on clintrial.gov using Boosperone in treating autism. So some people think that it's of some benefit and that it seems to have a way of working that might suggest benefits with a very nice side effect profile and one that one might tuck in the back for making some kind of differences. So what I want to move to now is thinking about that paradigm shift level, that level that says after the genes express themselves and start to form into that brain cell, what processes might have that not go so well? Could they be immune or inflammatory processes? Could they be evidence of oxidative stress, the body's not handling its toxic load well? Could there be something like disturbed methylation or mitochondrial dysfunction? disturbances in free fatty acid metabolism or excitatory inhibitory balance as we started to get into when we talked about memetine working on the NMDA receptors or even, and somewhat controversially, thinking about hormonal effects. Some people would say that perhaps autism is an extreme male disorder. Simon Baron Cohen says that, and says that perhaps it's related to males. And there have been some studies looking at testosterone and the masculinization, masculinization of the brain that would suggest maybe testosterone plays a role. There haven't been good studies saying that that's so. But there have been people using things like Lupron, they've lost their medical licenses for doing that, but um, using other kinds of testosterone blocking agents. Some say spironolactone blocks testosterone and is an anti older antihypertensive agent. And some are using that for the males that seem to be this high testosterone aggressive male with autism. But they're controversial treatments and are really fairly experimental, at least at this point. Some of the others that we'll talk about in these categories are beginning to have double-blind placebo-controlled trials that suggest that they might be making some difference in working at those areas in here where things like maybe nutrition, methyl B12, omega-3s, we even wondered if HBOT was producing anti-inflammatory reaction here that would make a difference, or immune function differences. And it will tell you about some of the agents that seem to be falling into those categories. The trick in this, though, is that there may be something in this process that's going on at a particular time in the development of somebody with autism, but it's not actively going on at the time that you're seeing them. So if you use that agent, and what I'm trying to suggest by this circle is that there might be a time that oxidative stress is the major thing that's leading to some kind of 
uh, altered uh, growth and development, or it might be inflammation or immune dysregulation or disturbed methylation. You have to find a way to know, is that an active process that I'm targeting with the treatment that I'm using? Because if I just use the treatment and it's not an active process, then I'm not going to see any benefit and I'm say, going to say it's not going to work. And if I do that in a clinical trial, I'll say it's a negative trial, but I didn't have a good biomarker to select people to come into the trial in the beginning. So that's part of what we were working on in that first part where I showed you the assessment, is to say, can we find these biomarkers that then be could begin to become our targets as we try these treatments so that we select on that basis? There are different kinds of ways that we can think of making these targets, food sensitivities, immune mechanisms, methylation, neurostimulatory type of interventions. And there are a lot of people that are beginning to think about how to make these kinds of treatments. If you go to clintrials.gov, and I did about a month ago, there are these two pages of treatments that are now in active, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials with autism, looking at whether they might be of help. Tetrahydrobiopterin, or sepopterin, is produced by a company uh, called Biomarin. Its trade name is Kuvan. It's used to treat PKU. We're actually doing a study right now at UCSF of children with P and adults with PKU who have trouble with attention and have trouble with anxiety. But two sites looked at using Kuvan for treating autism. Uh, uh, Glenn Elliott at Children's Health Council and Richie Fry, who was at the time at Baylor, did a study suggesting maybe it made a modest amount of difference, and it seems to affect neurotransmitter production. It's a very expensive medication, so it's not something that you'd run right out now based on those studies and give a try to. Minocycline is something that Rondi Hagerman has used here for treating children with fragile X. There are several trials now going on and using it to treat children with autism. There are a variety of others, which I won't walk you through all of, but just more to tell you that there are a number of different ways that we're thinking of treating autism that are looking at these kinds of other treatment targets that might be making a difference. What I'm going to spend the last part of this talk talking about is really the trials that we're doing and others have published that I think might be interesting. The other area of targets, though, are looking at mitochondrial function and looking at using things like Co CoQ10, looking at a whole variety in this paper that you can't see very well because of the sign at the bottom, but Husani is a very nice paper from a good, actually, a group of collaborators from a pharmaceutical company saying that they're now looking at these treatment targets of mitochondrial dysfunction in autism as ways that their company is beginning to look at developing new treatments for autism and finding biomarkers based on, bi on mitochondrial function for the way of determining who gets into their studies. So as I'd mentioned, a challenge in doing this kind of research is that we need to recruit based on validated endophenotypic bio biomarkers. We have to say, how can we select and put those kids into treatment so we have a better way of knowing whether they're going to benefit? And some of those treatments, some of those biomarkers might be blood tests. Some of them might be things like genomic assays. Some of them might be even things like stool samples. And I'll tell you about one study that we did for a digestive enzyme where this, they were selected based on having low fecal chymotrypsin, which I think the MIND Institute also did uh, in, in, in that study, looking at a difference that might be making some kind of a difference. So one study that we did that was in an effort to try and say, could we find a way of better using pharmacogenomics for looking at biomarkers, was a study where we, that we collected all of the samples at the MIND Institute, but was published after I had moved to UCSF. We wanted to say, could gene expression be used as a potential biomarker? And this was a study in collaboration with Frank Sharp at the MIND Institute, looking at gene expression. So we looked whether peripheral blood gene expression before treatment with risperidone 
was associated with improvements in severe behavioral disturbances. And we did an eight-week trial with risperidone in 42 subjects with a mean age of uh, uh, um, 112 months. What you can see in this map and what's reported up here is that we divided the groups into those that had the lowest ABC score and highest ABC score, and then looked at those that had genes that were highest expressed or lowest expressed, and found that there were groups that clustered in each way. And when we took it out into a larger graph, we found that there were five genes, or f five exomes, that could predict response, that predicted response before treatment. So those five exomes predicted who was going to respond to risperidone. And one of them, RNF40, had a high degree of reliability. For those of you that are involved in gene expression, you know that that's a real variable kind of finding. We don't know whether that could be replicated, even though it did have a fair number of subjects. It seemed to be promising, but when I took that result and said, let's do a bigger study, let's do an R01, and sent that to NIMH, NIMH said, gene expression analysis is too variable for you to do that big of a study. We don't want to fund you yet. You need to show that you can replicate what you've done. So I put the grant in as an R21, which is a smaller grant and is supposed to be innovative grants, and they said, you've already shown this. You don't need to do this again. So I talked to the project officer to say, well, how can I take this forward? And she said, well, why don't you do an R34? And so an R34 is a, meant to set up for a large service system project where you have large numbers of patients. So Rondi Hagerman at the Mind Institute and Antonio Hardin at Stanford and I put together a collaborative three-site grant to look at biomarkers that Rondi and Flora are doing and pharmacogenomics that Frank Sharp will be doing and that several other things would be involved as well in this three-site collaboration. And we'll hear later in the fall whether that act actually works. But I love the idea of thinking that we can begin to find this way of multi-sites working together to see if we can get large enough patient populations to show whether we can find valid biomarkers that can identify subgroups that we could use to target treatments. So we've been thinking about new model kind of therapeutic tr strategies. What could we use as treatments that are targeting those kinds of mechanisms that are involved? For immune and inflammatory processes, melatonin is thought to have an effect in that. And there's been a, several good reviews suggesting that melatonin makes a big difference for sleep in at least 50% of kids, one of them from the Mind Institute, that it also seems to make a difference in immune function. And one can find genetic markers of those people that are likely to respond to melatonin. IVIG, looking at immune function, the studies that have been done, and there are very few of them, don't suggest that they make a difference. But there are people trying to look at immune enhancers, and some of those studies that I listed that I took from the um, clintrials.gov were ones looking at improving immune function. Corticosteroids, no good studies, but I know a number of people in practice that are using corticosteroids with their with kids with autism saying that they find improvements, but they're open label. And then some of the, there was an interesting study of, um, of using um, an anti-inflammatory agent, the next study listed here, along with risperidone, saying that the, those people that were on the anti-inflammatory plus risperidone did better than those that were just on risperidone alone, suggesting some kind of an anti-inflammatory effect might also be of help to kids with uh, marked irritability and aggression. Looking at mitochondrial dysfunction, as I'd mentioned, there was a study of carnitine that Michael Ches did. There's not been any good studies of CoQ10, even though people use it fairly regularly for mitochondrial dysfunction. The other things listed there are things that anecdotally people use, and some have put into a mito cocktail that are being used now in one trial for what might be helpful for autism. 
For oxidative stress, people have looked at glutathione, methyl B12, and I'll tell you more about our trial with that. And then curcumin, you know, the kind of thing that goes into Indian food, into curry. Uh, some have said that it has an anti-inflammatory, antioxidant activity. It's been used for other disorders than autism. Some people saying that it makes a difference, and there's one ongoing trial using curcumin. It's not been published yet, looking at oxidative stress. Neurotransmitter production, we talked about tetrahydrobiopterin, listed some of those others in the other categories, looking at GABA, arbaclofen, Rondi's done a study here with Fragile X. Um, Gabatril is a newer agent that's being used as an add-on for treating uh, uh, seizures. It's being used now it's in several trials that are listed on clintrial.gov for, for treating autism. Glutamate receptors, uh, we talked about already memetine, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And then even lowering cholesterol. Um, some kids with autism seem to have high cholesterol levels, and perhaps lowering them makes a difference, and there are some trials listed on clintrial.gov. So in, in the last portion of what we have, I'll tell you about some trials that we've been doing and share with you some results that some are, are too early to call, some are at least showing some promise. We looked at, we thought about doing a trial of vitamin D, but, and we'll talk about that. We did a trial of hyperbaric oxygen while we were here, when I was here at the Mind Institute, the, um, eight, the hyperbaric oxygen center that's over on, uh, over near uh, the university, uh, agreed to give us 80 dives for kids. We did two sets of 40. We used um, cytokine biomarkers and uh, looked at outcomes, but it was an open label trial. We didn't find a way that we could do a double blind placebo control trial. Part of the issue was that when you go into that chamber and the chamber seals, it increases the oxygen. So in order to have normal room air oxygen, we'd actually have to pump in lower than room air oxygen air. And the IRB didn't like the idea that we were pumping in low oxygen to these kids in, this, in, the, in the, the thing. So we put the kids in without their parents, um, or sometimes it was with the parents. But the man who, who was running the center was very, very enthusiastic about the effects of HBOT. So he wasn't a good placebo control. He was, you know, this is going to make a huge difference for you. Nine out of 10 parents said made a big difference, really made a difference. We didn't find any objective measures that indicated that it made a difference. And we didn't find any changes in cytokines. But the kids didn't seem to have abnormal cytokines before they went in. So we should have selected based on their having abnormal cytokines. We thought at least half of them would have abnormal cytokines based on some of the studies that Paul Ashwood has done here. But we didn't find HBOT to be effective in those ways, except parents reported that it seemed to be. Methyl B12, I'm going to tell you more about the study we did here and the study that we're doing at UCSF. Omega-3s, I'm going to tell you a little more about the study we did here and the study that we're doing now. And then the memetine, the memetine study, I'll tell you a bit more about and the pancreatic digestive enzymes. So vitamin D. No studies have been published suggesting that vitamin D helps autism. No studies have been published suggesting vitamin D particularly helps anything. And yet we know that about a third of children typically developing children have low vitamin D levels, and about half of kids with autism tend to have low vitamin D levels. Some people have used that as a kind of model for autism, suggesting that perhaps dark-skinned people that move to northern climates who have higher incidence of autism do so because they're not getting enough vitamin D. Others have said perhaps the reason that kids in rainy climates have higher incidences of autism is because they're inside watching TV. All associational studies, all speculation, no way of really saying whether that's so or not, but we know vitamin D is a potent neurosteroid, and we know that there are low levels with autism. I would have to tell you that in my practice now, after reviewing this literature, 
I suggest parents supplement with vitamin D3. Sometimes I get vitamin D levels. They're almost always under 30 nanograms, which is the criteria for having low vitamin D levels. But sometimes without getting those levels, I still consider supplementing with vitamin D. Lots of people seem to take vitamin D. I don't find it makes any huge difference, but it makes a little difference. But based on our thinking about this, the Vitamin D Council said, we want to support you to do a study of vitamin D in autism. So we have, after a lot of struggle going through the IRB, the IRB said, How, what about calcitrol? If you supplement with vitamin D, you may get the level too high. That's going to affect your calcium levels. We said, we're going to follow calcium levels. They said, how are you going to know your, your vitamin D levels? We said, we're going to check those levels regularly. What's your upper limit? We're shooting for 100. We said 90 to 100, but they said, well, that's too high. And we were going to give people up to 6,000. Uh, we we're going to give people 10,000 as an, at a loading dose. We've decreased that now to six because of the IRB saying you might make them toxic. And yet, when you treat somebody that's vitamin D deficient, that has rickets, you sometimes, even as a loading dose, give 100,000 units. So there's just a lot of struggles that one goes goes through in thinking about these other kinds of treatments. But when we agreed to, to give that lower dose and then to use a target level of 90 and to measure these things regularly, they agreed. And now we've started a trial. We haven't found anybody that really wants to be in it. They just want to go home and take vitamin D3. They don't want to be in our double-blind placebo-controlled trial. So if you know of anybody that wants to, we'd be happy to see them. I mentioned the HBOT study to you already. There's two negative studies published, one positive study. The positive study was fairly poorly done. We um, have, we recruited 10 children here in Sacramento who had 80 dives at 1.5 ATA, which is the highest level usually used with 100% oxygen. And as I said, many parents reported benefit. Um, but we didn't find abnormal cytokine levels, and we didn't find those cytokine levels changed, and we didn't find changes in any objective measures that we were using in our trial. Ten subjects isn't quite enough. So I think, at least from our study, it was not totally clear. The study I'd like to tell you the most about is our methyl B12 study uh, at the MIND Institute. When I started there as the executive director, before I started there, the parents interviewed me. And they told me, you know, anybody that's going to be the executive director of the Mind Institute, we want that person to have an open mind. We want them to leave no stone unturned about what might be helpful for things with autism. We want you to do good science, but keep an open mind. So I thought about that. And, and then after I'd been there for a little while, somebody said, you should go to a Dan meeting. And everybody at the Mind Institute said, no, don't go to a Dan meeting. You'll ruin your reputation. You'll ruin our reputation. You know, those people don't do good science. It's not a place to go. But I thought, you know, the parents told me I should keep an open mind and I should go. And I went to a Dan meeting. And after a few hours, I left. I said, this, there's no science here. I don't, you know, how can they be saying what they're saying? But I was intrigued at their thinking. I was wondering, what are they doing? How are they making these associations? And are some people really getting better? And is there some way that it might be making a difference? So a number of us at the Mind Institute thought, well, let's call together a group of people and ask them, what things could we do a double-blind placebo-controlled trial doing? What kind of DAN treatments? And could we maybe even find a biomarker that would help us know who might respond and who might not? So we had a meeting at the Mind Institute, and Bernie Remlin helped us pick the people to come, and Rick Rollins. And we had about 40 people there. And we went through a whole bunch of trials. And the things they wanted us to do first, the one that they were most in favor of, was chelation. And we said, no, no, we're not going to do chelation as our first trial. That's too hard. And besides, you, have, you say that to, in order to do a good job of testing chelation, people have to be on the case in gluten-free diet for at least several weeks. There isn't a good way for us to do a placebo control. What's next? So the next one, they said, was methyl B12, injectable methyl B12. Try that. And there was a lady, Jill James, who is a really good bio, uh, bi biologist, has a great lab at Arkansas Children's that had shown changes in oxidative stress that were improved with methyl B12. So 
and we heard about improvements with injectable methyl B12. So we designed a double-blind placebo crossover trial. We didn't do two separate groups. We crossed them over, which has been criticized, but it was funded by the Mind Institute to get started, and we just wanted to see what we could get. And we gave it a relatively high dose. It was 67.5 micrograms per kilogram, but we're now doing 75 and giving it every three days. There's no real risk. There's some minor trauma from the sub-Q injection that you give, and some kids get a little more hyperactive, but we weren't aware of any kind of problems that would suggest that, and the IRB approved our doing the trial. Some of you um, in one of the previous talks saw a diagram somewhat like this, suggesting that this methyl group it, it, on one side, it, it, in different places, needs to be picked up in order to go through this pathway from methionine down to glutathione in order to help the body's handling toxic load. So the theoretical idea that was backed up by a few studies was that this pathway would be helped by supplementing with methyl B12. And that would it help by giving that methyl group in order to allow this path to continue to clear toxic uh, or oxidative stress kinds of uh, indicators. And, and there was at least a literature to suggest that actually happened. So we did 30 subjects in the 12-week double-blind study and found no clear significant difference between the two groups, the active or the placebo group. But there were kids that I thought did really well and I thought, how could we learn about those? I remember one kid, the second kid that came into our study, he was four, and he uh, had been in ABA for a little over a year. He didn't have much language. He'd been doing about the same for that little over a year in the ABA classroom. And we started the methyl B12. And within a few weeks, he was doing much better. And within a few weeks more, he had good language. He was talking, not good language, but he had a number of words and stringing sentences together. Looked much, much better. And by six months, he was asked, he told he didn't need to be in that preschool anymore because he was doing so well. Now, maybe the ABA finally kicked in. Maybe other things made a difference. But I have to tell you that every parent in that preschool brought their kid into our study, saying, I want our kid to have some of whatever he had. Not all of those kids did as well. And again, saying to us, there must be some biomarker. And we found about nine subjects of the 30 that demonstrated clinically significant improvement, that did much better. And those that did better seemed to show changes in this oxidized versus reduced glutathione. And we felt maybe that would serve as a biomarker. And based on that, Autism Speaks funded us to do 50 children using that biomarker, not for selection, but just to see if that could predict response. We've done now, I think, about 46 kids out of the 50. Uh, we've analyzed the data for 40 subjects. 10 out of the 20 on active treatment showed significant improvement. Six out of 20, though, um, sh on placebo showed improvement. So we had a 30% response rate uh, versus the 50% response. And at that point, it wasn't enough to show that active separated from placebo. We've done more kids as we're heading towards 50. We're presenting our data in France. Actually, Ralph Green from here is presenting his section, which has been looking at the different genetic aspects of methyl B12. Jill James is presenting hers. And we're also presenting this poster in a few weeks. So there will be some release of this data suggesting some kids do seem to do well on methyl B12. There are a number of you here that helped us with that, Leslie and Susan and others in that, in thinking about the first study and now in our second study, we hope that we'll find at least that there's a subgroup of kids that it's worth going through that trouble of giving sub-Q injections every three days for several weeks to make a difference in how they might do. Also here at the Mind Institute, we did a study of omega-3s didn't separate, but we showed a trend towards improvement. When we calculated what kind of an effect size we'd need to actually show that trend continuing to, to show great improvement, we needed a large number of subjects. And uh, we, put, we started to put in a grant, but realized it'd be several million dollars to show that 
whether omega-3 made a difference or not. We didn't think we'd get funded. But Ian, the Interactive Autism Network, agreed, and we got a grant from NIMH, where we're doing a trial now, an internet-based trial, where we're mailing people. Uh, they, they've been on Ian. They've gotten all their information entered. We mail them either placebo or active. We have a way of using that internet-based study to see whether omega-3s make a small difference, enough of a difference to show separation from placebo. I'd mentioned the memetine study, looking at, uh, and the, the, there are several studies uh, indicating some benefit. We've been doing the double-blind placebo control trial, and it's a multi-site trial. Um, Forrest has come back now saying that they're actually going to extend the number of subjects that they want. It would suggest to me that they did, uh, they broke the blind, did a or had somebody break the blind, do a preliminary analysis, and there was enough benefit that they wanted to add, add 30 more subjects in order to then go to the FDA and say they want an indication. So it suggests that maybe it's not a huge benefit, but it suggests that there is some benefit, perhaps from memetine working on the glutamate receptors. And this CureMark study uh, that I mentioned earlier that used fecal chymotrypsin as a way of um, selecting people, that you had to have a low fecal chymotrypsin. We were told about 60% of our subjects would, about 80% did, uh, seemed to be related to these people not being able to digest these large proteins. Some have suggested then that's the problem with the, in casein and gluten, that those large proteins don't get digested, and perhaps even something like this special combination of pancreatic digestive enzymes could help in that way. But interestingly, it seems, and I'm not supposed to say this, but I'm not, I don't know, I don't have any insider information. I just know that CureMark's going to the FDA with their data. They've just closed out all their, their subjects. And apparently going with this pancreatic digestive enzyme, not for GI symptoms, but for core symptoms of autism that they say have improved from using this kind of an intervention. There are other people looking in these areas as well. N-acetylcysteine, NAC, a Antonio Hardin, and I'll tell you about that study in just a minute, showed some ch changes that uh, active did separate from placebo using this dietary supplement or actually what might better be called a nutraceutical. Oxytocin, there are tons of studies right now going on looking at oxytocin, giving it multiple times a day, trying to pair that with some kind of a learning paradigm where kids could learn to be more trusted learn to be more social, learn to be more engaged. Some using it with fathers and sons, uh, seeing if the two of them might learn it together. Some using other kinds of paradigms, but wondering about oxytocin making a difference. And then back to Sally Rogers and her mirror neurons or behavioral re-sculpting of neurons with early targeted thoughtful interventions that can change not just the surface of the earth, but deeper down. Antonio's study, uh, Hardin's study of NAC, was uh, looking at this nutraceutical that affects glutamate and is an antioxidant. It was a 12-week double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial. It was initiated at 900 milligrams for four weeks. It went up eventually to where it was taking 900 milligrams three times a day. Other studies have used 1,200 twice a day, but it gets up to that around 2,400 milligrams a day. In, in Dr. Hardin's study, there were 33 subjects, and oral NAC was well tolerated compared to placebo. NAC resulted in significant improvement in the ABC irritability scale. Nice to have a medication, or nice to have a nutraceutical or an intervention that doesn't cause a huge amount of weight gain, doesn't cause a huge amount of other difficulties. I don't think NAC's going to replace atypical neuroleptics, but it suggests that it makes a modest amount of difference. There are also good studies suggesting that vitamin and mineral supplements make a difference. Jim Adams did one good study, a randomized control trial for three months of kids, 141 kids showing improvement in their nutritional and metabolic status using just good, uh, a good multiple vitamin uh, that was put together particularly with autism in mind showing a, a modest improvement, sometimes showing actually a fairly large improvement in that 0.008 level. So in conclusion, I have on my last slide or two, 
I think that level that I talked about, trying to say, can you make an intervention at every level? Could you do something that's thinking about ABA, making a difference for the behavior, speech and language? Could you make a difference in terms of even neurotransmitters that may not be working as well? Could you make a difference for how the body, how those genes are expressing themselves? Could you do a good medical evaluation, looking at genetic factors, neuro, GI workup, other medical symptoms? Can you make a difference there using speech and OT, using behavioral interventions, treating associated treatments, and then thinking about uh, associated uh, biomedical treatments. If you're thinking about, I guess kind of, uh, this is a funny place to put this slide, but I was trying to think at the end, what could I say about just the problems that you come up against a lot? You know, there's the standard things, and I could give a standard psychopharm lecture, but one of the things that I think we come up against as, as being some of the most troubling is to say, what do you do about a kid that just won't sleep? Well, obviously, you start off with melatonin. I've learned from a number of people that L-threonine might be a second kind of thing, especially if they have trouble more with terminal insomnia or mid-sleep insomnia. You use melatonin at the beginning, L-threonine later. Hydroxazine, you know, used at like a Vistaril, um, uh, is something that I hadn't fully thought of, but I found a number of people using with benefit. I've used regularly lately without it wearing off or causing any difficulties. Then on to trazodone, or clonidine. Trazodone and uh, remeron, mirtazapine and, and olanzapine both cause a lot of weight gain. I've used olanzapine a few times in kids that are so violent and aggressive that they've broken arms and jaws and their parents won't sleep any other way and it's the only way I can get them to sleep. Others are using things like doxepin and quetiapine. Um, weight gain on an atypical, what do you do? You start off with, say you've tried risperidone, aripiprazole maybe doesn't cause quite as much weight gain but it still does for some people. Ziprazidone, people are using, saying it's weight neutral, but it seems to have a little more EPS, and some may say not, may not be quite as effective. Acenapine, lyricidone, we talked about already, but the metformin uh, is something that doesn't always take care of weight gain. It may help take care of those increased um, lipid measures. Some people, a, a good, uh, a gastroenterologist or an endocrinologist that I work with at UCSF thinks that we should put all kids that we're putting on atypicals on metformin at the same time. The GI disturbance is something that's troubling enough that maybe we wouldn't want to try it for every kid. Some interesting things for skin picking, SSRIs, Cymbalta is something that I've been reading about, some people having some benefit, I haven't tried it, Boosperone. Screeching, yelping, it's one of the problems I have with kids that come in and they, they just really disrupt parents' lives. You try everything. One that you don't often think of trying is Depakote, Divalprox. I've found some benefit from that. And then finally, in conclusion, biomedical, I think of melatonin for sleep, omega-3s, everybody takes them. Why shouldn't somebody with autism? And there's some indication that it makes some benefit. Vitamin D3, multiple vitamins. For GI symptoms, I use probiotics and digestive enzymes, all things that I think are safe and uh, don't seem to have any problems and can make some difference. So autism is heterogeneous. Multiple factors account for the increase in prevalence. There's new interventions based on gene by environment interactions and epigenetics. And effective intervention really involves an integrated approach. Someone asked me the other day when I was going to stop using this slide. I don't know, because I like it so much. But as you know, all know, the Mind Institute did an art contest where people entered. This was one of my favorites. It's called the haircut. You can see how this little boy, this is hanging in the Mind Institute. The little boy actually lives in Marin County, and I still see him at UCSF, so I feel OK about using this slide, even though it hangs at the Mind Institute, and there's a picture of it in my office. But you, this guy, you see, is cutting his hair. This bee is probably the buzz of a razor um, cutting his hair. But his mom said he had little language when he drew this picture. And in all of the pictures that he drew, he always showed an escape route. 
This door is probably his escape route. I'm hoping that this new model, this new way of thinking, not of trying to stomp out autism, but helping the body's resilience to push back against those things that are overwhelming it, can be a way that we think about autism that will release people from that veil that has come over them, that can lead to them doing better. These new models, while I don't think they're showing huge effect size, are leading us in a direction that I think will be more hopeful. Thank you. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.